They are among the most interesting, powerful, and mysterious devices in Middle-earth. They were created before the ages of the world began and were used through the days of the Lord of the Rings. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the Palantiri, the Seeing Stones. It is believed that the Palantiri were created by Feanor during the early days of the world in Valinor. Feanor, who is best known for his creation of the Silmarils, created many of these Seeing Stones, though we don't know exactly how many. There are a total of eight Palantiri that we know of for certain. The first and greatest we know of is the Master Stone, the chief of all the Palantiri. It was placed in the Tower of Avalone on the island of Tol Eresea. The others we know of come into play later and in Middle-earth rather than in Valinor. In the latter part of the Second Age, Numenor is split into two factions. One is the King's Men, who have come to covet the elves' immortality and have fallen to Morgoth worship under the guidance of Sauron. The other, smaller group, is known as the Faithful. In those days, the elves of Middle-earth give the Palantiri to Amandil, the father of Elendil. They did so in an effort to comfort the faithful Numenorians, since they themselves were no longer welcome in the land which had fallen to Sauron's influence. We are never told where these Palantiri were or who possessed them during the First Age. When Numenor is destroyed in 3319 of the Second Age, Elendil and his sons escape and take with them the Seven Seeing Stones. They sail to Middle-earth as survivors of their once great kingdom. As Elendil, Anarion, and Isildur establish the realms of Gondor and Arnor, Elendil stations three Palantiri in his northern kingdom, while placing four in the southern kingdom where his sons dwell. We'll begin in the north. First, we have the Elendil Stone, also known as the Elostirion Stone. Elendil places the Palantir so that it is aligned west toward the Master Stone on Tol Eresea across the sea. It is said this stone could not make contact with the other six in Middle-earth, but only Elendil was able to use it to look west to the Undying Lands. Numenor, however, he could not see, for it was covered by the sea forever. While Elendil was the only man to use the stone, the elves of Círdan cared for it in later days, in its tower of Emin Bered. Over the centuries, even after Arnor falls in its wars with the Witch King, Groups of elves would make pilgrimages to the Palantir, with which they could glimpse Varda in Valinor, the most revered of all the Valar among the elves. In fact, the group led by Gildor, who Frodo, Sam, and Pippin meet, were returning from such a trip. The Elendil Stone would remain in its tower until after Sauron's downfall. It is then taken back to Valinor on the White Ship, along with the Ring Bearers of Middle-earth. Next, we have the stones of Amonsul and Anuminas. Anuminas was the original capital of the kingdom of Arnor, and the stone would remain there throughout Arnor's existence. And when the realm is split into three in 861 of the Third Age, it remains with the kingdom of Arthedain. The Amonsul stone was placed in the Great Watchtower by Elendil as an important location in Arnor. When Arnor is split, Arthedain, Rudaur, and Cardolan each lay claim to Amonsul, in large part because they wanted control of the Palantir. When Amonsul is destroyed by the Witch King's army in 1409, the stone is taken to Fornost, the second capital of Arnor, and later Arthedain. Nearly 600 years later, what remains of Arthedain is facing its final days and is being overrun by Angmar. Its last king, Arvadui, manages to save both the Anomina stone and the Amonsul Stone from the Witch King's army and flees to the north. There he is helped by the Lossoth people, who warn him that he should wait out the Witch King there rather than boarding a boat in the Northern Sea. Arvidui ignores this advice and boards the ship. The ship's hull is crushed by ice, and Arvidui and his two seeing stones are lost to the sea. As we make our way to the southern realm of Gondor, Let's cover how the Palantiri actually work and what their capabilities are. Their first purpose, which we get a sense of in Peter Jackson's adaptations, is to communicate with one another. But as you may have wondered as we talked about the Elendil Stone, a Palantir had to be aligned properly in order for it to communicate with the other stones. 
Essentially, the stones had axes, which had to be pointing up and down in order to work. When someone wanted to use a palantir, they would orient themselves so they themselves would also face the direction they wished to communicate. This person, known as the surveyor, then sends their thoughts by thinking what they wish to say. On the other end, the user would hear those thoughts in their own mind. This method of communication is an example of osanwe, a quenya term meaning interchange of thought. Now what you might not realize if you primarily know the films is that the palantiri could also be used to see people and places throughout Middle Earth, though this requires much more skill by the surveyor. The only limitations on what they could see in addition to the will of the user were darkness and shrouding. Shrouding was the technique where one could keep their actions secret from any potential use of a palantir. If someone tried to view a person using this technique, the surveyor would only see a shadow or a deep mist. Now the knowledge of how to use shrouding was one of the lost mysteries of the palantiri. The largest of all the Middle Earth palantiri and the chief of the seven in Middle Earth is placed in Osgiliath, the capital city of Gondor. It is so large that it cannot be lifted by a single man. It was placed in a chamber known as Ostgiliath, the Dome of Stars, named for its ceiling which was painted to look like a starry sky. This stone, being the master, had the unique ability to spy on the other stones. The Osgiliath stone is actually the first of the seven to be lost. From 1432 to 1447, Gondor was consumed by a civil war known as the Kinstrife. In 1437, in the midst of this conflict, the city of Osgiliath is burned. As the city is engulfed in flames, the Palantir is lost in the river Anduin and would never be retrieved. Finally, we have the three remaining Palantiri that come into play during the Lord of the Rings. The Ithil Stone was placed in Isildur city of Minas Ithil. Roughly 30 years after Arvadui and his Palantiri are lost to the sea, the city of Minas Ithil is attacked and captured by the Nazgul and transformed into the city of Minas Morgul. The Ithil stone is taken by the Nazgul to Baradur, where Sauron would use it to influence both Saruman and Denethor. It's possible the Ithil stone was destroyed when Baradur is destroyed at the end of the War of the Ring. In the city of Minas Tirith, we have the Anor stone, named for the original title of the city, Minas Anor. After the line of kings ends in 2050, the Palantir is kept secret by the ruling stewards of Gondor. It would go unused until Denethor begins to use it after becoming steward, as his realm is falling under the shadow of Mordor and the growing threat of Sauron. Denethor, who uses the stone to watch his lands, comes to engage Sauron in a battle of wills, while both are using their respective Palantiri. In a testament to his incredible strength of will, Denethor is not corrupted by the Dark Lord. The toll of this effort does, however, cause Denethor to age prematurely and leads him to despair about the future of Gondor. Denethor is holding the stone as he burns on the pyre in his final moments of life. As for the stone, it is said that after this, only those of extraordinary power could see anything in the stone except two flaming hands. Finally, we have the Orthanc Stone. This palantir is placed in the Tower of Orthanc at Isengard. By the late Third Age, as the kings of Gondor are long gone, the Stone of Orthanc is nearly forgotten by the stewards. It is partially due to this stone that Saruman offers to take up residence in Orthanc, in hopes of obtaining the stone for himself. In 2759, Saruman is given the Key of Orthanc by Steward Baron of Gondor and welcomed by King Freilof of Rohan to become their northern ally. There, just as he expected, he finds the Palantir of Orthanc in its rightful place. Roughly 250 years later, Saruman uses the Palantir for the first time. By now, Sauron has the Ithil Stone in Barad-dûr, and unlike Denethor, he is able to wrestle the Orthanc Stone and the wizard to his will. After the parley with Saruman, Wormtongue, not realizing what it is, throws the Orthanc stone at Gandalf and the others. Pippin inadvertently uses the stone later that night, causing Sauron to see him and assume Pippin is the halfling carrying the One Ring. Knowing what we now know of how the Palantiri work, we realize it was by chance that as Pippin is fumbling with the Orthanc stone, 
that he sets it properly on its axis, he himself sitting on its western side, pointing toward Baradur, allowing Sauron to communicate with him. Soon after this, Aragorn would also use the stone, revealing himself to be the heir of Isildur, and that he possessed the reforged sword of Elendil. This leads Sauron into open war with Gondor, keeping his eye on Aragorn and the men of Middle-earth, rather than his own lands and the hobbits making their way to Mount Doom. In the end, the Orthanc Stone is the only stone to remain in Middle-earth into the Fourth Age and to be wholly usable and unmarred. Like so many things throughout the history of Middle-earth, these once great relics are largely lost to time, only remaining in tales and songs, such as the one Gandalf tells to Pippin as they travel to Minas Tirith. Tall ships and tall kings, three times three, what brought they from founded land over the flowing sea? Seven stars and seven stones and one white tree. So what other relics or objects from Middle-earth would you like me to cover in a future video? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe and the bell so you never miss your weekly dose of Nerd of the Rings. And if you enjoyed the artwork, be sure to check out the artists in the description and visit their sites to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. As always, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible, including Tom DeBombadil19, Gail Elizabeth, Jim Limber Davis, Sky Carcass, Salim Rahman, Smorzerk, Zetrok, Gimilkad, Debbie, Grand Strategy Nerd, Chief40123, Mid Earth Wellness, and The Dark Haired One. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.